Thank you very much, Drs. Goldblatt and Lipinska, and thank you all for coming. We filled this room really nicely, so I'm really excited that we have a great audience for this. Okay, so we're going to discuss the workup of inguinodynia, and um, these are my disclosures. This is a big topic to squeeze into a, a single talk. I will do my best to give you the basics of, of doing your inguinodynia workup so you can do the best for your patients. So specifically, we're going to talk about the workup and not the treatment, because that's a, a whole different other um, a set, of, uh, work, a set of treatment options, and the speakers after me will give you a little bit of insight into part of the workup for inguinodynia. So the way I look at groin pain is, have they had hernia surgery or not? And if, you, if they've had no surgery yet, then they fall into the chronic pelvic pain mode, and that has a very long list of uh, reasons for ch chronic pelvic pain. Um, it can be uh, due to an inguinal hernia, and I believe that many inguinal hernias are missed as part of the chronic pelvic pain workup because they're going to non-general non surgeons um, and they, they can't figure out that the hernia itself is causing the chronic pelvic pain. But as you can tell, the list is really, really long um, and spans multiple specialties. So if you're going to be treating someone before they've had a hernia repair in the, and trying to work up why they have groin pain or inguinodynia, you really should have a multidisciplinary team approach. And in my group, we have um, specific surgeons and specialists that, that see my patients and are familiar with this population. And they include gynecologists, urologists, orthopedic surgeons, physical therapists, pain management specialists, pelvic floor specialists, an allergist, and a rheumatologist. And they're all kind of you know, in my little black book of specialists that I, that I reach out to to help me work up these patients. The, the theme throughout my talk will be everything is in the history and just patiently go through the history. Everything that you decide to do will stem from your history. So yes, exam is important, imaging is important, there may be other tests. But if you spend the time to get a very good history, that will really drive you in the right direction for the workup of inguinodynia. For the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus on probably what most of you are here about, which is what do you do with the groin pain after they've had a hernia repair, or what we call post-herniorrhaphy post chronic pain. So the, the definition is any persisting pain greater than three months. In the literature, that's kind of how chronic pain is um, discussed. We really care about persistent pain even beyond three months. Um, the, the number is highly variable as to what the incidence of this is. I think 12% is something we pretty much agree on, but there's been a different range in the, in the literature. About 3% are severe and debilitating pain, and um, those patients can be very, very complicated. Uh, this can be from an open repair or a laparoscopic repair, a mesh repair or a non-mesh repair. In fact, within the past year, there was a great paper that specifically looked at chronic pelvic pain or chronic groin pain after hernia repair mesh versus non-mesh repair, and the, the, the instance was very similar. So we, we forget that before we introduced mesh, there were people that were, that were disabled or even had chronic pain due to nerve injury or other things from a tissue repair. So there are about 800,000 inguinal hernias repaired per year. If you multiply that by 12%, that means 96,000 patients in the United States alone will have inguinodynia postoperatively, and of, the, of those, um, of the total, 3% will have, have severe debilitating pain. That's 24,000 patients a year that are significantly impaired from their hernia repair. I look at patients as having one of two different categories of pain, neuropathic and nociceptive. And the reason for this is the treatment options are also different and the workup is different. So neuropathic is any type of nerve pain, whether it's from a direct nerve injury or entrapment. And then the nociceptive pain is really much everything else, which can be related to the mesh or related to a recurrence, an infection or inflammation, following up of the mesh, which we call meshoma. Again, the history will pretty much drive you to figure out whether this is neuropathic or nociceptive pain from the, from the onset. And remember, it's not just one diagnosis. You may have a patient that has a mixed bag. They may have nerve pain and nociceptive pain. They may have another reason for their groin pain that was missed, let's say a hip injury. So 
uh, again, the history and some physical exam will tr be able to drive you towards figuring it out. Here are some examples of what a history um, can do to help figure out what's wrong with your patient. If they're complaining of, of electrical burning pain, if they use the word hot poker, uh, if they say that they've changed the underwear they wear, they can't wear jeans anymore, that's neuropathic pain almost always. If they're just standing in your office and refuse to sit down because they prefer to stand, uh, if they describe their pain of, more, of worse with certain activities that close off the, the groin, so bending, sitting, crossing their legs, that's typically a meshoma type patient and that's the main reason for their pain. If they have return of their prior uh, prior pain or the pain is mostly activity related, or it's worse with coughing, straining, bending, getting in and out of their car or in and out of their bed. They don't like sitting at work. Uh, they're best when lying flat. That may just be a simple hernia recurrence. And then there's this very complicated, smaller fraction of patients that have inflammatory pain, and that can spark not only localized inflammation with swelling and redness, but also generalized symptoms. So for the neuropathic pain workup, it's very straightforward. You block them. You can block them either as an anatomic nerve block or a trigger point injection where their pain is. And I do it in my office uh, under local, uh, under ultrasound guidance. And if they come to you and they have an immediate cure, go after that nerve. And you have to know your anatomy to do that. If they are worse, then you just filled a space with even more content than, the, than it liked and you're causing pain. So what could be already there full of content? A hernia recurrence, most likely, sometimes a meshoma. So that's, that can lead you towards the kind of the, the hernia recurrence uh, pathway. And if they're not better, but kind of maybe sort of, then you still need to keep the neuropathic um, pain in their, in their differential. So how do you work up the nociceptive pain? pain? Remember, you can be from a recurrence, a meshoma, or inflammation, and imaging is the next step. So you've done your history, you've done your examination, you can't figure it out. You need to do imaging, and more importantly, you have to correctly interpret that imaging. So here's a CT scan, and you'll see there's a ball of gray, which is your meshoma, and it's distorted the bladder. And with the right history, that's the cause of their pain. The other one is a plug here. You can see, again, a ball of gray, and in CT scan, everything is a shade of gray, and then the bladder is distorted from the mass effect. And that, in the right, with the right history, that would be the cause of the pain. Here's a, an, an image MRI with some fluid collection underneath the mesh. That's from an infection. Here's a more interesting one, CT scan. The white line is a PTFE-based mesh, and then there's what the radiologist called post-operative changes. You should not have post-operative changes this, this severe several years out. So this was basically the same patient. MRI shows a lot of inflammation. This is a mesh infection. We published a, a lot about um, radiologic findings on inguinal hernias, and I'd like to kind of bring this to your attention that not all imaging is the same. What we showed is that the negative predictive value is really, really low for CT scan and then um, also for ultrasound. So if you get a CT or ultrasound as part of your workup and, and it doesn't show anything that your history or exam suggests, you're not done yet. You have to move on to an MRI. X-ray is important if you have a patient with either hip problems or uh, tox, and you can kind of see all these 16 tox in this patient. Ultrasound is important, but you know what? When there's mesh in place, ultrasound is very difficult uh, to help with your post-operative diagnosis, and so I don't usually use an ultrasound in my workup. What I do use is an MRI, and remember the MRI can also show you occult hernias that the CT scan will, may not show you. So in summary, history, 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 and do it with patience and focus. The physical exam will have to try and support your history. Do a ner nerve block if and only if you have neuropathic symptoms. I beg you, do not send your patient to a pain doctor where they will get lost and say, oh, this is pain, go to your pain doctor. They have no idea what you did in the operation. They are going to do nerve blocks and nerve ablations and give them tons of medications, and they're going to miss the fact that this was a hernia recurrence or a meshoma. So not everything is neur neuropathic. And then if you wish to use imaging, ultrasound, or MRI, 
um, is best if they have chronic pelvic pain before surgery. MRI with, with or without x-rays is best for post-operative pain. And you can use your CT if you prefer, but understand it has limited sensitivity and specificity in the groin and pelvis, and you may need to upgrade to an MRI. And then reassess after you have all of your information. Thank you very much.